Hello. Okay, so thank you very much for sitting through until 4.15 p.m. Uh, and waiting around for us. Uh, so we're going to talk about developer champion programs. Um, and earlier, Addo gave his, uh, his story of what they've been doing at Auth0. And this is actually somewhat different in that Carla and I have been researching what a whole load of different companies are doing with their developer champion programs in an attempt to try and find what works best in different circumstances. And this is part of that story. So, hello, uh, konnichiwa. So as, uh, as Ode said, um, I'm Matthew Ravel. I work for a company called Hoopy and... Uh, and I'm Carla, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I work for MXC in Berlin, but I'm originally from Portugal. So, why are we talking about developer champion programs? Well, we're talking, but and we know it's 4 p.m. You might be getting tired, but you're still going to be involved. So, let's kick this off with some questions. So, raise your hand here for even though we're all in most of us in developer relations, who was originally a developer? How many? Quite a few. Interesting. Question number two, who knows what a champion program is? Not as many. Well, we hope you'll know by the end of the talk. And who is part of a, who of those developers part of a champion program? <laughs> two, three, four, Five, nice. Six. So if we're wrong, correct us. <laughs> now, lastly, are you ready? Okay, so we're going to go back to basics, and I don't want to worry you. I'm not going to redefine developer relations. Um, but what we are going to do is we're going to ask, why do companies run DevRel programs? Very briefly, we're going to look at that. And, you know, this is basic. The reasons are that people don't know about our products, so we want to tell them. And also, when people are using our products, we want to educate them and support them. And lastly, we want to close that, that feedback loop. So when developers tell us about things that aren't quite as good in the product as they could be and so on, we want to bring that back to engineering and product. And also, we want to be the voices of developers within our companies. So how does developer relations do all of that? Well, broadly speaking, there are four different pillars to developer relations. One is all the awareness stuff that we do, like blogging, like going out to meetups, speaking at conferences. Then there's community where we manage the process that enables people to become involved with our developer product and our, our, the broader community around it. Then there's a the product itself, creating SDKs, creating maybe even sample apps or feeding back that, that developer feedback to the product team, but basically having an influence on the product itself. And then education and support, so hanging out in Stack Overflow, or doing training days, whatever it might be. But as ambitious as we might be, and as much as we want to do all these four things, there are two fairly basic constraints on, on our developer relations programs. Budget, even if you are AWS or Google or whoever, you still have some limits on how much money you have to spend. And then people, or more, more appropriately right now, hiring. So it's really hard to hire the right people for your team. And so you will always have this, this gap between what you want to do and what you can afford and the people that you have on your team to help you achieve that. So it's hard to scale your program to the way that you want to. But champion programs let us use our developer community to help us bridge the gap. Now, this is an unusual all areas of life, people are willing to do things such as get involved in fan clubs for baby metal or um, go and clean up their local park or whatever it might be. People take part in things for seemingly no other reason other than that they want to give something back. But it's, it's really important to, to understand thoroughly the motivations for developers in getting involved in developer programs in order to be able to run them efficiently. So, Carla, why do developers take part in developer programs? Well, that is a good question indeed. So, let's keep in mind that when we're asking developers to take part of, in a champion program, we're asking them to take time out of their personal life, out of not being with their families, 
of spending some time maybe writing an article maybe rather than watching a movie. These are things that we need to be conscious of. But there are some quite interesting things that motivate them to be there, to be part of pro, uh, champion programs. So from our research, we asked why, why are you part, why being an MVP or a champion, why is it interested to you? And the one that stands out the most is the access to key people. So imagine you're a developer and you're in love with the software and you want to know the team, you want to know the engineering team and having this access is so rewarding for them that is one of the key reasons for them to be part of the program. Second of all, progress their career. We're talking about people that if they're interested, the likelihood of them becoming experts in that technology is quite high. So what's the next step? What's the next level? What's the recognition? This allows for a company to say, I vouch for this developer that he's qualified, that he's good. Or she. Sorry? Or she. Or she, sorry. Another, another reason. So we like to find people that we can identify with. And developers sometimes have a hard time doing this, right? Not everyone is into the same technology or believes in it, in building code the same way. And this way you can find group of people that identifies with the same values that you do. And lastly, but not least, access to knowledge. So one of the key things here being access to roadmap. So imagine that you're a developer. Well, most of you are, no need to imagine. And one, one, imagine you can know what's coming up. What's, what's the roadmap going to be? That information is powerful. It puts you ahead of the competition. So these are the four things that we've that we've understood that make developers take part in champion programs. And you can kind of tie this up into a phrase which is social capital. And you know, this, this is the idea that just as in financial sense we have capital, we have money that we can invest, and then that can maybe give us a return or maybe we lose it. In the social setting, we can have a worth, a value that we can then put to work within that, that community. So, you know, if social capital is a bit of an odd phrase, then think of it as your value to the community. And let's have a look at how that works. So, you're a community member, and you want to engage with that community. And what you can do is you can use your value to the community. That might be, that might be your social standing, it might be your ability to write well, or it might be your ability to present well, in order to help that community. So, let's, let's have a look. So, you're on your own but you get a bit closer to the community and you do something, you, you spend some, some of your value. And the effect is that that not only improves things for other people, it builds their, their participation, their value in the community, but it also feeds back to you and builds your social capital. And so what happens with, with, with developer communities generally, and particularly what we're trying to influence with developer programs, is the idea that you're harnessing this power that people have within communities in order to not just help your developer product, but also the people themselves and to help people to, to improve their status, improve their, their skills, and also help you get a better situation for your developer product. So a champion program is like a, a framework for, for building out um, a mutually beneficial set of programs that that help you and help your community. Now, before you can say what developer program, sorry, champion program you're going to adopt, you need to think about what it is that you're trying to do more broadly with your developer relations strategy. So, rainbows are nice, but what we're going to look at is four different objectives that you can have as a mix within your developer relations strategy. And the precise mix that you have will depend, sorry, will determine the type of champion program that might be appropriate for you. So we can't do everything all at once, so generally speaking we will have a mix. So some programs might look like this. If you particularly, if you have a, a more mature community and one of your, your goals is really to educate that community to make them even more proficient in your product, um, but also you want to retain developers and stop them perhaps straying elsewhere and, and focusing their time elsewhere, then perhaps you might have a focus on education and retention, which would mean perhaps that you can't focus so much on awareness and growth. 
But if you're quite new and you're really going all out, you know, you want to get people to be aware of your product and you want them to sign up, get the API key, download the SDK, whatever it might be. And that would mean that you don't have perhaps in, enough resources to then focus on, on the other two areas. So really what we're asking is, what problem is a champion program going to solve for you? So what we found is that there are four archetypes. Four models, basically. Yes, yeah. in other words. Um, just going to through them very quickly right now. The most basic one and that you can see more commonly, and we'll go into each of them individually, is reward and motivate. After that, a little bit more complex, force multiplier. Then we also have a content factory and a land and expand model. So let's start by the reward and motivate. This will be ideal if you're trying to retain your community, your, commu your older community members. So usually this is your building blocks, your building foundation for a champion program that you can later elaborate on. So you have a community, let's say, of one year old. And there's people that you can identify that have been there long, that keep contributing, that spend time. And those people you want to acknowledge, you want to say thank you. You want to recognize them. Why? Why does it matter? Because it will keep them motivated. It will make them contribute more. And this will, by, as a byproduct, also make others starting com contributing more. So one of the goals of this, very simply, is, is to encourage community, community participation. Uh, the benefits is that it also encourages people to specialize in the product, so they're contributing more and more, and it keeps them motivated. That's the key part of this of this type of program. Uh, and as a risk, however, it's you're maintaining rather than making the program um, progress. So rather than directing where you could the contributions of your community might be, you're just being more reactive rather than proactive. It is, however, a low effort. Uh, so if you don't have a big team, if all you can do is they have time to put together a swag box and send it to your most active contributors, this is a good one to do, to start with. Then, force multiplier. So here, this, let's put it this way. Your ambitions are higher than what you have resources to do because you're interested in growing awareness in education, retention, and growth. So what you really need is an extended team, and you can create that through your community members. You can engage with them and help, and help them contribute more. So if you have someone who writes articles, talk with them and say, hey, this is a great article, but you know what? You can take it to the next level. Let me help you. So you, a key, key part in this type is that you support our, your community. So a big difference is that you, rather than being just reactive and maintaining the community, you are pushing your community to deliver more contributions for them to become better developers. Because the more you learn, the more you contribute, the more you're engaged, you will obviously become better. So, the, the goal of this program is to direct, to be able to give, um, a real, sorry, <laughs> it's to be able to direct the community participation, like I was saying. So you can say, we want you guys to focus more on this, or we want the community contributions to shift to this way. One of the good benefits is that it's a scalable growth. So if you have a small team, you can easily have 30 people who are creating contents, meetups, and who you can count on to help you grow. One of the risks, and this is the, the part where you need to be careful of, is community burnout. So like I said initially, keep in mind that every community member has a life. So you need to make sure that you're not asking them to do too much. You can't say, hey, this week we're expecting three articles. That's 
that's not right. So you need to be careful with that. And another risk and why sometimes it's, why this is also more complex, you do need internal buy-in because this will take a lot of effort from, from the team to be able to manage as you're supporting all of the developers that take part in this type of program. And on that point, um, the companies that we've spoken to doing this kind of program generally have between one and four full-time people looking after a program of this type. Obviously, that will depend very much on the size of, of the program and the company, but yeah, it does take effort. Okay, so specialising slightly more, those were perhaps the, uh, the more generic types of developer champion program that we came across. But specialising more are two um, that we're going to look at now. One is the content factory. So this is where you're particularly looking to push out either awareness or you're looking to help educate um, your, your, existing, uh, your existing developers. Now, developer relations programs generally don't have huge teams other than Nexmo, and uh, so <laughs> good, good for them. Um, but really, what can you do as a relatively small team, you know, content-wise this is? In, in, in a week, you, you might, you, you're going to have various different things you're having to do. You're going to have to go and probably do some, uh, maybe one of you will be doing an event, someone else will be doing some admin, you know, maybe somebody's writing some SDKs, uh, doing some updates to the SDKs, whatever it might be. But content-wise, you're going to be lucky if you get two good blog posts and maybe a how-to guide out a week. Maybe, maybe more on, on a good week, but, you know, on an average week, that's, that's probably realistic, maybe. I mean, if you're doing lots of events, maybe not even that. So what you can do is harness your broader community to help you churn out content. And I use that phrase um, advisedly because a lot of the time this does become a, almost a, a machine for just pushing out content and, and, and pushing out into as many places as possible. And so what you're doing with this kind of developer pro champion program is you're, you're pushing out your, your idea of what good content looks like to people within the community and then converting them to become content producers for you. And so you might on one side have a bunch of Android developers who you know are working with your product and they're going to go out into the Android community and create content for you there. And on the other hand you might have some React Native developers who will go out and create React Native content for you. The point is that you're going to reach places that you wouldn't do otherwise or technology communities with this content because they have other expertise than you and they have more time available. And you might even start finding that people who are doing this for you will then help to convert developers within other communities that you didn't even know about to become uh, part of your program. You won't win everyone though. This is one of the risks with this program is that not everybody wants to write or produce content. You know, so you will, you will not alienate, but you won't be able to find a space for everyone in your community in this particular type of program. However, once you do have that bigger program, then you can start doing all sorts of things you didn't expect before. So we've heard today about people creating books in Japanese for, for particular, um, for particular uh, software, and, and that's great. So you, know, you might have people who are able to create books for you, or, or even movies or whatever, and that will let you then start to experiment with more uh, ambitious types of content. So here's a really good example of, of a company doing this, is MongoDB. They spend a great deal of time um, uh, encouraging their, their community to push out content. And they use a system called Influitive, which is basically a gamification platform. So people get points every time they write, write an article, and then they can spend these points in a store and get things like a Bose speaker or whatever it might be. Now, your opinion and my opinion of whether that's effective and a good way of doing it may not align with that particular model. But it certainly works for them, and it's enabled them to, to push out a lot of content. Um, the risks are that, obviously, the quality can be variable. Um, and you, know, you are going to not provide a champion program for people who don't want to do content. But it's a relatively low effort way of, of getting that content out into places you wouldn't otherwise be able to go. And talking of places you wouldn't be able to go, let's talk about the fourth and final archetype or model that we found. And that's land and expand. And I'll be honest, there's only one really good example of that, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But this is where you want to you wanna push out awareness and you want to grow into new places that you wouldn't have got to otherwise. So let's say you've got a team in Tokyo, a team in uh, Berlin, and one in the Bay Area. And what you really want to do is also have a team in Melbourne, 
and one in Mumbai and one in Sao Paulo. But again, we are against that budget and hiring problem. You don't have the budget or the people to push your program out into those cities. And that's sad. And I believe that's a sad cat. Carla disagrees. She says it's just a cute cat, but I think it's sad. Um, so just like Heineken refreshes the parts that other beers don't reach, this Land and Expand lets you um, reach the parts that your team cannot. And that might be a geographical location or it might be a technology community. But it's about harnessing um, people to reach places that you wouldn't get to on your own. So here's the plan. You get community members on the ground. That might be, like I say, in a city or it might be in a technology community, but these are people who know their space. They know their city. They know their people, right? And they will become your reps in that place or in that community. And you provide them support, whether it's financial or a mixture of financial and training and so on in order to be the best rep they can be for your company. And what they get out of it is status, they get to learn, um, and they get that, all that access and things that we were mentioning before. And then they have the exciting, hopefully, uh, benefit as well of being able to sign up new community members for your, your developer program. And that's a, a benefit to them, that, but also obviously is a benefit to you. And so rather than just being sad and not being able to get to those target cities you have, you then extend your team into them with almost, I'm not going to call it a, a shadow organization, but it's like a, an extended, they're like cousins of your developer relations program. And they will represent you in those cities uh, with your support, and that enables you to do more than you could otherwise. So that example, I mean, GitHub's campus experts is really the best example of this. And I think more people are going to start doing this. Um, but yeah, the goal is to take the program into new territories, um, and particularly territories that you probably couldn't justify an investment in initially. So it's a really great way of having a proving ground for a city, or testing it out, or just reaching places that you don't have the expertise to. It does require, as Joe would tell you, um, a great deal of effort. You know, it's going to take um, uh, probably initially quite a lot of travel to m make those one-to-one -one personal relationships with people, but also you've got to you've got to keep tabs on 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 how people are representing your brand, and also you've got to support them to be the best representative they can be, and also to get as much out of the, the program that they can. So it requires a lot of trust in people, and it requires a lot of effort. But I would say that the the develop sorry the campus experts program at GitHub is is proof that it that it pays off in 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 long term but big ways. So one thing that we've been looking at, Carla, yes. is, um, <laughs> is uh, really a way of, of trying to use these archetypes or these models in a way that enables you to select one, the right one for your, your current situation. Um, and I think ideally we'll, we'll come up with something where you can put in some numbers or, or slide some sliders on a website and it'll t give you a recommendation with a big disclaimer. Um, but ultimately, if you know your developer relations program well and you know your strategies, so your, your objectives well, then you can work it out fairly, fairly easily yourself. So if you can plot your, your priorities or roughly where you fit on this quadrant, then you'll know. So if, if you're uh, if your program is primarily about awareness with uh, and, and growth with a bit of a yep primarily about awareness and growth with a bit of education then um, you're probably going to go for a land and expand maybe um, if your program is really just about retaining people and making sure that they're respected and rewarded for their contribution then reward and motivate is a good one if you want to do a bit of everything or you want to get people to help just uh, extend your program generally, then force multiplier is a good model. And if you're particularly interested in awareness and education, then perhaps the content factory is the way to go. So we're not done yet. Well, with this talk, we're coming up closely. <laughs> but the research is not done. What does this, this mean? We're doing an analysis report on champion programs for 
a lot of different companies and we want to share the findings so that all developer relations team have the tools and can make informed decisions on what is the best champion program that they can create. So that will be coming later this year. And for you to make sure that you don't miss this, subscribe to the newsletter of DevRel and you'll get it. It's that simple. It doesn't take much effort. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be publishing that later this year and we'll, we'll put that in the newsletter uh, once it's available. Um, so I guess we haven't been doing questions today. So if you do have questions, then you know, grab us by the coffee area or wherever we might be. Um, and we'll be happy to talk. And I recommend talking to Joe and Don as well um, from GitHub. Um, but yeah, and also Addo about what they've been doing at Auth0 if you didn't catch his talk earlier. Um, and if you do want to get in touch after this, then hello at hoopy.io. Um, we'll, we'll get it to both of us, basically. So thank you very much for your time and uh, your thank attention. You.